as a horrible solution time, but it doesn't need to learn very often. This is when you have to run that SVM solver to find the ideal cut plate. Uh, but its classification time is good, and it has a fairly constant rate of growth in its database. Uh, the compressive algorithm has a horrible factor here. Basically, it is data dependent on how many uh, things look similar to the unknown. If the unknown is completely, un is completely unknown, it just drops right through very quickly. If it looks very much like something you've seen before, it slows way down because it's trying to find the optimal compression. Anyway, here's the results. Bullet slide number one. All of these classifiers are either at or close enough to claim victory. But here is the OR of all three, it's just one OR gate. 99.91% recall. This is one error, this is less than one error per thousand. This is like hitting on pulling to an inside straight three times in a row. If you're in the casino, don't do that. Uh, precision, 99.24. Plenty, 10 times better than a product needs. Here's, let's, here's the cross error rate. Notice again, it's correlated. We would expect even on a database of this size to get a less than one error, one false, excuse me, one false miss on this data set. And we actually get on the order of 20. Gloat slide number two. Again, 99.9% recall. I'm going a little faster because we had a delay at the start. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Uh, did we just get lucky? Let's try reshuffling the data set so that it, it turns out that maybe there was a sequencing thing that made it easy. Well, here's three different sequences we ran. It turns out that we actually had a sequence for the first test that was hard. <laughs> the actual accuracy averaging over all three, three tests is 99.928. And the precision is 99. Uh, almost 99.3. So we're actually we're unlucky on that first pass. Now, what about that that uh, expert system? It's still running. Uh, if you OR that in, so now you have an OR gate with four inputs. You have 99.9 percent .9 recall. That was no change. The precision dropped to 98.8. So this is your, this is essentially your false alarm control, and your false positive rate because you have only very few non-confidential documents here, goes up to almost 10%. So why the heck would you ever want to keep that expert system around? The answer is you have black swans in the world. A black swan is a document or a type of thing that you have no previous experience with, yet you have reason to believe may exist. And these can occur in confidential information. First, you may have a new project. No information currently exists for you to train on. You need a body of documents. Preferably, you need a thousand documents to start. Uh, if the project's new, it may not have a thousand documents. They may not, they may not have a thousand emails yet. Or you may have a category that is so tightly controlled that the people who have that information may not want to turn it over to you, and they may be justified in that. Say, how can it be justified? We're trying to protect you. Wait. So this. Regexing system gets you still a 90% protection. Here's an example, we'll skip that. Uh, Searle's Chinese room problem. This is a pro an old problem in computer science. The idea is, can you write a set of instructions, as, as a human expert, write a set of instructions on how to pretend to be human, uh, specifically to emulate someone who can speak Chinese, and Searle brought it up as a, as a point of philosophy. No, no human could write a set of instructions that tell another person how to speak Chinese without having, you know, just by performing rote, you know, write this down in English, make the following squiggle mark, and then look at what the squiggle marks that came in through a slot in the door and branch on that, branch on equal. And in 1980, it was unthinkable that that could happen. And then the, expert, the rise of expert systems happened, and now we don't even think about it. It's, it's common to have an expert system that is better than the human. The amazing part of this research here is that the system was developed with absolutely no domain knowledge. None of the people who wrote those classifiers can read Japanese. We don't know what the, class of, what the confidential projects were. We don't even know how to read it. Uh, yet, the system exceeds the human performance by an order of magnitude. Now, here's the bad news. You say, well, this is so great. I want this. Uh, your training data may be hard to come by. 
people may be justifiably reluctant to give it to you. And that training data is the concentrated essence of everything that is tightly valued by your company. It's the best of your intellectual property, and it's a target. And it's worse news. Once you've trained that classifier, that, that, uh, that database, it is possible to reverse engineer it. And uh, this is not a theoretical attack. John Graham Cumming actually pulled this off in 2004 against spam days. He called it finding the kryptonite, finding that set of words that would get any spam message through a spam base filter. How are we doing on time? Okay, thank you. So you must guard your guardians. You must watch your watchman. You can go back and look at some of the examples now if we want. Uh, automatic classification works very well. It can cut your accidental disclosure rate by two orders of magnitude. So essentially the probability of an accidental disclosure actually becoming a spill where it gets out into the internet is now equivalent to the probability that you can draw it when inside straight three times in the casino. In a row, three times in a row. Uh, Multi-classifier machine learning techniques are the way to go. Uh, first, it's much more accurate than a, a human expert system. And second, um, you want that expert system in there to protect against things you have no that you can't get training data for. So it's a multi-classifier system, it's a hybrid. This is not a panacea. There are risks involved. That high quality training data is a very high quality, high value theft target. And even if you don't let the training data go away, just the act of putting that classifier on a system that maybe can self be penetrated, the classifier can be reverse engineered. But there's good news. If you happen to be Japanese, you can buy this now as a turnkey system from Mitsubishi Electric in Japan. It's called Mail Server Log, Log Auditor Mail Server. It's actually an appliance. Uh, two, two U, it's a 2U high, has two quad core Xeons in it, a bunch of disks. It actually logs all your mail, it, it checks things for you. Uh, it's very nice if you're in Japan. The other news is if you aren't in Japan, you can roll your own. All the classifiers are freely available, open source, GPL'd. If you want to link it against C, there's an LGPL'd version called libcrm114, and that's up on SourceForge. And there's even examples in there. Now, not all the classifiers that are in big CRM114 are in the libcrm114 yet. We're still doing that transition. The two are not compatible in terms of their internal format. But libcrm114 is about 10 times faster. So it's, it really screams. OK, now we can do questions. And yes? Um, so it, it strikes me that Japanese is probably a lot more formalized than English. Have you done these against English? You know, I'm wondering if you could be helped by the rigid forms of Japanese language, where English is a little bit more free form. You know, if you're writing mm. confidential and documented in Japanese, there may be certain verbiage you always use, whereas in English, you could be using colloquialisms even in a confidential oh, document. Yeah, you mirrors all right. Yeah. They don't? Okay, so Japanese is, is, is free form. I'm not assuming that this would include informal email. This is, this is internal stuff. Because you're trying to catch accidental leakage. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are formal documents in there, no doubt. I mean, there's pow there's uh, there's doc, doc files, there's uh, um, there's PPTs, there's PDFs. But my understanding is, is it's it's the natural way things get written, and the hand wave justification that it will work this way. This is about the same accuracy as we see for spam filtering. Three three nines, four nines, depending on how much data you train. So it's probably it's probably not a problem. Yes. So, I think you, you mentioned that your false positive rate is about 
Ah. You gotta be careful there. Right here. There's really two numbers here and they, they are influenced by each other, but it's weird. Okay, precision is the probability that for any particular <coughs> non-confidential item, that it will raise, a, raise an alarm. Or not, excuse me, not raise an alarm. And the probability is one minus 99.297, so it's less than 1%. The false alarm rate, though, is biased against us here because there are so few non-confidential documents in this data set. There's 12,500 confidentials and only 1,700 non-confidentials. And so even a small number of errors here makes this number look large. So I guess the question is, is so if we add more of uh, AMP, so to speak, to the training set, uh, how much better can we make that precision number? Because this, this number stays about the same. This number goes down. Because this number is a derivative of how many uh, items you have to test with. So how does that compare to the most manageable Depends on the spam filter. That's Some spam. Okay. Well, here's here's the trick in spam filtering, um, and we have arguments about this in, in sp the spam filtering uh, secret cabals. <laughs> Some people in the spam filtering world feel that a, a, an occasional spam, one, two, three a day, is okay if you to avoid having ever having a false rejection. So thou shalt not reject good email ever. And there are other people in the spam filtering world who say, if I let granny get this fish, because she only sees maybe one every two or three weeks, she will probably fall for it and she will have her life savings drained. Then you start to say, well, maybe uh, false accepts are much worse than false refusals. So we, we play this game, we, we yell at each other all the time. I personally say I'm drawing the line between the two at 50-50. An, an error of a false accept is equal in badness to an error of a false reject. And that's where we drew the line here. We didn't, we didn't uh, play with thresholding. We didn't slide the thresholds. Other people will differ in that. So I've got to be honest and say there is not consensus in the spam filtering community about whether a false accept or a false reject is more worthy or more avoidable or, or more desirable. Uh, I guess I'm just thinking about this in terms of sort of an actual operational environment. So, like, clearly there's the Mitsubishi selling this as an appliance or whatever. Right? Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, you know, what the sort of operational workflow is. Like. Oh, oh, that, that, that makes it easier, actually. Yeah. Because um, emails going out are always human generated by a person you can identify in your organization. That means there, if there, even if there's a 5 or 10% chance that you hit, the guy hits send, and he gets an immediate beatback that says, that looks confidential, please override or have your manager override, then that's a low overhead operation. So that, that's not horrible. Whereas, you know, 97, 98% of the email on the internet now is spam. So even letting 1% through uh, still, still will swamp you. It means that you're, you have more spam in your inbox than you have real email. And if you don't have a sharp eye, you'll probably get suckered into some fish or identity theft. Other questions? Yes, please. So how do you, if you are passing from Japanese, right? so I suppose correct what you, what you said, you cannot organize this stuff. I'm sorry? I'm... In English, we have, we have words. Yes. So a, a, a document that is a sequence of words, right? Yes. But in Japanese, it's, you said this, this no words. No well, the words are there. It's no just that we don't have a way to yeah, separate no them mechanically. Yeah. I mean, so how do you do that? The features. How do you? I assume that one feature equals one byte. One byte. There's a stream of UTF-8 coming in, and we say, okay, here's the first byte. That's a one feature. Here's an, here's the next byte. That's one feature. And then we do the phrasing thing. Same phrasing trick. You take byte, 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 skip, byte, byte, skip, skip, byte, byte, skip, 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 byte. So you're using the characters, UTF-8 characters? Yes, but UTF-8 characters can be one to four bytes long. We don't parse UTF-8. We just take it as a, a stream of bytes. And 